Let me um, introduce our uh, last speaker, uh, Professor Robert Kelly, who is one of the world's leading experts on North American Paleo-Indians. His archaeological interests focus not on the Native Americans that we celebrate in the paintings and the movies and so on who were here in the early uh, centuries of, of uh, European colonial immigration, but he's interested in the people who came here millennia ago. Uh, Dr. Kelly has spent a lifetime excavating, and like most archaeologists, he spends his summers in the field and his winters writing up discoveries and then, of course, planning for the next summer's expeditions. He researches hunter-gatherers, and his book, The Foraging Spectrum, Diversity in Hunter-Gatherer Lifeways, is so respected that the press recently had him uh, revise it. In the past decade, he's been studying caves and rock shelters of the Bighorn Mountains, researching ancient climate change and its impact on human migration behavior in the Bighorn Basin, and investigating how Paleo-Indians hunted mammoths. Recently, uh, Robert has started to take advantage of another aspect of climate change, the melting ice and glaciers in the upper reaches of the Rocky Mountains. The loss of ice that is centuries and even millennia old is gradually revealing the artifacts and remains of the continents early <coughs> humans. With the ongoing increase in temperature, there's a race against time, or with warmth, mm -hmm. with rock and with decay, of course. Mm -hmm. Professor Kelly is the past president of the Society for American Archaeology and co-author of two textbooks on archaeology, now in their fifth <coughs> and seventh editions, a sign of widespread use by students. His most recent book is The Fifth Beginning, what of six million years of human history can tell us about the future, and Professor Kelly will talk to us on that subject today. If, if you were to ask archaeologists why they do what they do, they'll probably quote you Winston Churchill. If you want it, uh, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see. We understand the past in order to know something about the future. And that's what I want to talk about today. The, the past and the future. So I'm going to talk about archaeology, and then I'll talk about the present, not archaeology. In order to do this, you have to understand a couple of things about the way archaeologists think. We think in terms of things, material objects. The, the material signature of humanity in the, in the ground. That's the only thing that archaeologists have to work with, really. And we do this by looking at the, the spread of different kinds of things over long, long spans of time. These are ones that, that might be familiar to you, at least the terms. Stone Age, Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron, Iron Age. These are marked by different uh, material things, copper, bronze, iron, stone. This is what we have to use, but it's not what archaeologists are really interested in. What we're really interested in is what these things have to tell us about organization in human society and how the organization of human society changed over, over time. That's what we're really interested in. And I decided to, to, to take this, this attribute of archaeology, which I think is its strength, and use it to its greatest extent by looking at the entire history of humanity, all six million years of it, and the entire globe. And I'm looking for um, uh, changes, significant changes, in the material signature of human behavior that signal radical shifts in the nature of the organization of human societies. And then I want to use that to look to the present and to the future. I think of this like sitting in the back row of an IMAX theater watching a really, really, really long movie. And anytime you watch a movie, you know that there are, t there are times when the, the movie shifts, right? The plot changes. You discover something about a character and suddenly the movie's no longer the same, right? It's like, it's like, oh my God, you mean Darth Vader is Luke's father? 
<laughs> it's like, oh, it's just, everything's suddenly different. Those, those are the moments when, when the signature of humanity changes and it signals a change in the, the way human societies are organized. Not small changes, not little tweaks, but big, massive changes. When I do this for all of human history, looking at the, at the globe as the, my region, I see four major transitions. I call these beginnings because there are they're, they're times when human society ba basically began anew. Human history starts six million years ago when the line that would become human breaks away from the rest of the primate line. They would go on to become chimps and bonobos. But another line, through a very long uh, pr process, would eventually become us. And for the first three million years or so of that time span, we're just another interesting uh, ape on the savanna. We're probably bi bipedal, um, but living like lots of other apes we're, we're, we're living. Until about 3.3 million years ago, when stone tools appear. This is the sort of thing that if you're watching that IMAX movie, you'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, primates, primates. Wait a second. Those primates are using stone tools. That's never happened before. It's a different signature in the, in the ground. The, the earliest tools are very simple affairs. These old one choppers. Uh, later on, we get a little bit more uh, 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 sophisticated uh, hand axes about a million and a half years ago. These were a game changer. Our ancestors are, are limited to Africa, but about a million and a half years ago, with stone tools in their hands, they move out from Africa uh, into Southwest Asia, down into Southeast Asia, and eventually into Europe as, as well. This, we, we were changed into something completely different. We were probably hunting. We were a primate that was a serious hunter. We were using uh, fire probably by the later end of, the, of this. We may have been pair, pair bonding, things that you don't see in other primates. It's a change in the, in the movie's plot. Things roll along for a long time. The movie rolls along, rolls along, rolls along, really until about 200,000 years ago. Sometime between 250,000 years ago, there's another big shift in the nature of human society. And this again is reflected in a radical change in the things left behind, in the material signature of humanity. It comes in, in, in two, two areas. One of these is art. Some of the earliest art <coughs> is very, very simple. Uh, the stone here is from a site in South Africa, 77,000 years old. It's got sort of X's cut into it and then lines sort of connecting the, the X's. It's very, very simple. I could do this and I have no artistic talent whatsoever, right? There's also shell beads that show up in a number of, of, of places, or mostly across the African continent. And eventually, we blossom into this magnificent cave art of, of Europe. This is one of my favorites from Chauvet Cave in southern France, is these cave, cave lions. Um, but you also get carvings like this, these ivory carvings. That's a little tiny carving. She's about this, this big. At least we think it's a she, but we don't really know. So we have art appearing. And this is, this is significant because art has a meaning to it. All of it, all of art carries a meaning to it. What's the meaning of these cave bears, of these etched lines, of this, this carved face? I don't know. And I, I'm not sure that I ever will know. But I do know it carried meaning for whoever made it and for whoever was looking at it. And this is different. This is a different kind of, of, of primate. This is, this is a primate that's able to think in terms of symbols. This is a primate that could tell stories, that could tell lies, that could use analogies, that could use meta metaphors. This is a different kind of, of, of primate, and obviously one that's using language not as a, a very simple communication system, but in a very, very sophisticated manner. The second thing that shows up at about the same time is burial ritual. Up on this, until this, this time, 
we weren't burying the dead. Or in a few cases, it appears we were burying the dead, but there's no evidence of any kind of ritual. It almost looks like you're just trying to get rid of a smelly carcass by burying it in the ground. But about the same time that art appears, we get evidence of burial ritual. People who are put into the ground with some kind of activity around that. This is a, uh, this man here who died about 24,000 years ago. He's buried with a bunch of tools with him, some personal objects, like a bunch of beads that would have been a, a headdress. There's a stone tool that he's, he's clutching in his hand. And all that red there is red ochre. It's, a, it's an iron um, uh, uh, pigment. It's ground up into a powder. It's what they would make red paint out of to paint on the walls of caves. And in this case, this, they just poured this red pigment over his body. I don't know why they did that. It carried some meaning for the people who were doing it. It was the proper way to send this person over onto the next side. And that means people were thinking about there's something after death. This is religion. I don't know what the religion was like. But if you're thinking about life after death, you're thinking about religion. This is a radical shift. And this is when we became truly human. Everything rolls along. Fully modern humans arise in Africa. And they're living as hunting and gathering peoples. And sometime after 100,000 years ago, those hunter-gatherers begin to migrate out of Africa. Once they became cultural, developed art, developed burial rituals, religion, they spread out of Africa. This capacity to be cultural made us enormously successful. And we eventually spread as hunter-gatherers across most of the globe. By 10,000 years ago, we're in southern South, South America, having spread across Asia and Europe, across the Bering Strait, down through the Americas, down to Ushuaia, Argent, Argentina. We were amazingly successful, and this is an amazingly rapid spread of the human species across the, the globe. We replaced some of the earlier folks who were there who were sort of human, but not quite human, folks like the Neanderthals in Europe. So the entire globe gets colonized by around 10 to 12,000 year, years ago, with, with a few exceptions, some islands in the Pacific and Antarctica, the high Arctic, and so on. And it's kind of curious that at that point, we go through the third beginning, the third shift. This is the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture, which occurs in a number of different places and involves a number of different kinds of, of, of plants. The earliest is in the Near East, where things like wheat and barley were domesticated on the order of, of 12,000 year, years ago. Uh, corn, maize, uh, is initially developed in southern Mexico. Comes from a plant called teosinte, about the, it's about the size of your pinky. And it was eventually selected, and they were doing selective breeding over thousands of years to develop the corn that we buy in markets today. Millet in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, potatoes in the highland uh, Andes, rice in uh, uh, Asia, various other crops in different places. And these eventually spread across much of the globe. Maize, for example, would eventually spread down the Andes into the country of Chile and would spread up into the southwestern United States and eastern United States actually up into Canada, which is its, its absolute northern limit. This changed, changed everything. Instead of having nomadic camps, we now had sedentary villages. Instead of very ephemeral houses, we had substantial houses because people were living there year-round for many, many years. We had things like wells being dug, storehouses being constructed, lots of lots of really physical evidence of a, of a human com community. The way in which we were living completely changed. Uh, trade begins to take off, so we now have substantial movement of goods across rather large regions uh, 
uh, so a, a completely different orientation in the way human societies were relating to one, one another. Human population begins to increase at this point. It's been slowly increasing throughout time, but it really begins to increase with agriculture because agriculture increases the carrying capacity of, of land. That rolls along not so long. It's the, the movie, not much of the movie has to go by for the, the fourth beginning to kick in. And that's the beginning of what anthropologists call states. Uh, don't confuse this with states like the United States. This is a, talking about a kind of, a particular kind of organization with several levels to it and a professional bureaucratic class, a ruling class, and then a very large mm, laborer, if not slave, uh, class. This is marked by another uh, change in the material signature of humanity, which is large, impressive, often beautiful public architecture. Public architecture devoted to religion, public architecture devoted to uh, markets, public architecture devoted to the, the governing of large numbers of, of people, and public architecture devoted to protection. This is, in some ways, is a magnificent time. This is when we have specialists in art, in science, in architecture, in math mathematics, all of which is needed to construct these magnificent buildings. And this arises in different places in the, in the world. Starting about the earliest is Uruk in Southwest Asia. It's down, that's in, in what's now um, uh, uh, Iraq. Lots of good happens, some bad happens too. This is when poverty appears. You can't have poverty unless you've got inequality. There were some people at the top who had access to whatever they needed, in fact, who had access to more than they, they needed, and there were larger numbers of people at the bottom who didn't have that kind of access or who, in fact, were slaves. Slavery would be a notion that would be really unthinkable to the small hunting and gathering communities of more than 12,000 year, years ago. It now becomes not only thinkable in state societies, but for the people at the top, it was obvious that some people would be enslaved. And this is when war appears. Now, people have whacked each other for as long as there have been people around. You get pissed off at your neighbor and Boom, you explode, right? You don't even know what you're doing. But it, with the origins of state societies, with the appearance of state societies, this is when war appears. This is when you have groups of, of people, mostly men, whose job it is to fight. A whole array of material goods appears that archaeologists recover whose only purpose is to kill people. Now, a hunter-gatherer can kill somebody with their bow and arrow or with their spear, but that's not the intention of that, of that tool. That, the intention of that tool is to hunt. But you may turn it against your, your fellow man if he ticks you off enough. But here we have a whole class of stuff whose only purpose is to kill people. This is the sort of thing that an archaeologist goes, that's interesting. We never had swords and shields before. Now we've got swords and shields, and then the whole menagerie of you know, medieval warfare, for example. This is a radical change in the way people would relate to one, one another. I'm going to kill you, not because I got anything against you personally, but because I've been told by the guys on top that you're despicable. I don't know you personally, but they've told me I have to kill you, or there's probably extreme punishment that's going to come down on me, so it's me or you. It's going to be you. Right? We live in the fourth beginning. It started 5,000 years ago. We still live in the fourth beginning. That's what I know as an archaeologist. And as an archaeologist, I, I know that stuff because of the kind of perspective that I took on it. Looking at the things 
the material signature of humanity and noting that there are these almost global shifts in that, that signature of, of people in the ground. So I ask myself, are we done? Is that it? There's been all this stuff that's happened over the last six million years, but now we're done, we're finished. We've reached the point that we're going to reach. I have to think sort of like my colleagues 10,000 years in the future and ask what would they see when they look back on the past? And we, of course, will be ancient history to them. Will they have seen another shift in the material signature of, of humanity? Will they have seen a shift that's global in character? And I think the answer is, is yes. Here's why. Again, we're going to look at the material signature of, of people across the globe, right? This is a map of shipwrecks. It's just World War II era shipwrecks. I can't find a map of all the shipwrecks in the world. This is just World War II era ship, shipwrecks. An archaeologist would look at these shipwrecks and go, huh, I wonder how old they are, and they would go out and figure out the ages of all of these shipwrecks. We could do it through radiocarbon dating or some new technique in the, in the, in the future. But if they did that, what they would find is that there's a few very old shipwrecks, relatively few, in the Mediterranean. These are Roman, Phoenician, Greek vessels. All the other dots on the map, they all date to after A.D. 1500. And most of them are going to be in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now that's the sort of thing an archaeologist would look at and go, that's curious. We got no shipwrecks all over the world except for these few in the Mediterranean. And then suddenly after A.D. 1500, boom, there's shipwrecks everywhere. That's, that's odd. That's a change in the material signature that it hasn't been there for six million years. They might also then look at the moon and at Mars. There's artifacts on the moon and Mars, stuff that people left behind. And if you date this stuff, it all dates to the late 20th century. And by the way, the stuff on the moon, there's some really obvious stuff like scientific equipment that they just ditched there because there's no point in taking it back. There's also stuff like frozen bags of vomit. Um, there's a wad of $2 bills. There's golf clubs. I'm just, I'd really like to be around when the archaeologists of the future try and figure out what does this all mean? There's millions of bits of stuff circling the Earth. Some of it will burn up in the atmosphere, but some of it's going to be there for thousands and thousands of years. If archaeologists could figure out how old it is, they'd see it's all dates to the late 20th century. That's weird. They'd say, that's, that's a difference. We never had this before, and then suddenly it, it appears. What does, that, what does that mean? They would see things like, objects that are made in one part of the world show up all over the world, everywhere. Stuff made in China. I don't care where you go in the world, you'll find stuff that was made in China. This is a, a evidence of global trade, of, of course. It's never existed before. People have traded, sometimes hundreds of miles, but they've never traded at, at an entirely global scale. And we'd see all the remnants of moving stuff and people around. All the technology of aircraft, ships, uh, ports. We'd see the internet, which has resulted in the continents literally being tied together by cables, the first of which was laid in the, about the mid-19th century. If we were to look at DNA, the DNA in human skeletal material, if you want to find DNA in human skeletal material that's, uh, let's say, of African origin, prior to A.D. 1500, the only place you'll find it is in Africa. But after A.D. 1500, archaeologists would discover that you can find individuals 
with African DNA in their skeletal material all over the world as a function of slavery, as a function of uh, uh, later of, of capitalist economies moving people around the globe. We could look at the isotopic composition of our bone. Prior to AD 1500, the composition of your bone re would reflect a local diet. It would reflect the local foods and the local sediments that those foods were growing in. We can do this through things like oxygen and, isotope, uh, oxygen and um, carbon isotopes and strontium and some other trace, trace elements. After AD 1500, you would start to find more and more, and it really accelerates in the 20th century, that the isotopic composition of your bone doesn't reflect your local environment, but in fact reflects the world. I'm sure all of you today ate food that was not raised in rock springs. <laughs> right? Yeah? If you eat bananas, they ain't grown in rock springs. I can assure you of that. So on all these levels, archaeologists would look at all these things and go, oh my god, this is, th th we've never seen this before. Then there's just the, the sheer footprint of humanity on the face of the planet. This is the US from space today. A mere 200 years ago, to an archaeologist, that's like that. A mere 200 years ago, it looked like this. This is Denver in 1850, or an artist's reconstruction of it. 150 years later, this is what Denver looks like. This is, not, this is, this is less than a second in the archaeological time, time clock. It just, boom. It, to an archaeologist, it would look like this appeared overnight. It didn't, of course, but it appeared very, very rapidly. That kind of rapid development is, the world's never seen it before. We have massive buildings. The Khufu's Pyramid in outside uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, stands about 450 feet tall. It was, it was the tallest structure in the world at the time, and it held the record for 4,000 years. The record was broken. Uh, it depends on which building you want to choose, but let's say the Eiffel Tower in the late 19th century, and then that's broken by Oh, the Empire State Building, Sears Tower, blah, blah, blah. A whole series of buildings get built until we end up with the Dubai skyscraper. We have m mega cities like Tokyo. 40 million people live in Tokyo. 40 million was the population of the Earth 5,000 years ago. Now that entire population can live in one city, and that's not the only one. We have uh, landfills, like the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island, outside New, New York, which is one of the world's largest structures. A garbage dump is one of the world's largest structures. And it already was the, one of the largest structures in the world before we interred the, uh, uh, the World Trade Center there. The speed of change has vastly increased. Anyone in here who's older knows this, right? Uh, my father was born in 1925 in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The cool technology of the day was the zipper. The zipper. Vacuum tubes came along when he was a few years old. Those are quickly replaced by transistors. That was my generation's cool technology. And those were replaced by uh, mi microchips which is what that ant is carrying in its, in its jaws there. My father had an icebox in his house. It literally was an icebox that was kept cool by a block of ice delivered to his house in a ho horse and, and wagon in Rhode Island. His father used to fly the mail from Rhode Island to Boston in a biplane. Both of them watched men walk on the moon. My father flew on the con con Concorde. Amazing change, just, just through the 20th century, over a 100-year period. We don't have, usually I give this lecture to college classes, so I've got a lot of 18, 19-year-olds in there, and I, I love to ask them, what is this? <laughs> I, had, I had one tell me this, this week, oh, it's a, 
isn't that just an early notebook computer? <laughs> it's an IBM Selectric typewriter, and when I was in graduate school, I thought, that's all the technology I needed, you know? If I could have one of those, life would be perfect. And a slide projector, have you guys ever seen a slide projector? Have you seen it in use? How many times? No? You've never seen one in use? Yeah. That's, that's, that's pre-PowerPoint. -power, that's what we used to do. And everybody thinks that, oh, you know, we've had cell phones. My young people think, hey, that cell phone's forever, right? <laughs> ten years. Well, so cell phones go back a little further, but the smartphone is ten years old. That's all. And it's a phenomenally powerful computer that we can all carry in our pocket. Amazing change. Just in the last century, the rate of change is, is astounding. That's another characteristic of this time. Most of the changes in the past, changes to, let's say, the origins of agriculture, is a product of population growth. Human population has been slowly growing and growing and growing over the last, uh, at least the last 100,000 years. It's been growing and growing and growing. My colleagues and I calculate that the rate of growth until the 19th century was only 0.04%. So very, very slow. But give enough time, and that builds up to a lot of people. World population in the mid-19th century was about a billion people in the mid-19th century. Due to some medical changes, primarily in the mid-19th century, we now stand at about 7.5 billion people. That is, it took us 6 million years to reach 1 billion, and another 150 years to reach seven, seven and a half billion. The rate of growth has slowed a little bit over time. Nonetheless, you all will see a world of, could be close to 10 billion people. Population growth has driven change in the past. Population growth is going to continue at a, at a high rate. The material signature of, of humanity of the last 500 and especially the last 100 years is, has, signals a dramatic shift. The conclusion we draw is that we're in the fifth beginning. It's hard to see it, a transition when you're part of it, but from an archaeological perspective, we're in the fifth beginning, a time of dramatic, huge change. I can look, th when I, in, the, in the book, I, I take each of these first four beginnings and I talk about the processes that are uh, at, at work uh, in them. And I'm not going into those here. But that gives me uh, um, practice at looking for what processes are at work today that logically are going to produce some dramatic shift in the way human society is organized. I think there's three of them cost of war, the economic effects of global capitalism, and the cultural effects of globalization. The arms race has been going on for 5,000 years. Just everyone building a new offensive weapon, and I build a new defensive weapon, and you build a new offensive weapon, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And it just builds up, and builds up, and builds up, until nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons are sort of the end. Because even a pissant little country like North Korea that could be crushed instantly has got nuclear weapons, so it's kind of, you can't really touch it. We could go in there and, and destroy them if we wanted to, but before we did that, they'll take out Seoul. And they know, every nuclear equipped uh, country knows that that's all they need to have. That's all they need to have. You can't attack Russia because Russia will bomb London, London is the financial capital of the world, and that shuts down the entire world's finances. That's all it would take. And they know that, and everyone else knows, knows that. It's kind of a, a stalemate now. And yet, and yet, the cost of war just keeps going up and up and up. Mustang fighter, in today's dollars, costs $700,000. That's cheap technology. It's throwaway te technology. It's been replaced, its replacement today is the, is the F-35 fighter, which I think costs $135,000, $135 million, sorry. 
Stealth bomber, $800 million. The Zumwalt destroyer just launched a little while ago, $4.5 billion. Anyone know what the shells cost for their guns? One, one shell for their guns. They have a different kind of gun. It's not like just like a big, you know, 22. It's, it's, a, it's a, a rail gun. It, it operates in a whole different way of propulsion. No one knows what they cost? Is this, is this, huh? 800,000. Yeah, or the savings. For one. For one. One. $800,000. For one. The Gerald Ford just launched. $13 billion. Uh, actually, it's about three years behind, <coughs> behind schedule. This is phenomenal sums of money. This is not throwaway tech technology. I, I, I would not want to be the captain of the Zumwalt if it got sunk. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. This is just huge sums of money that, that for technology that really can't be used. And at the same time, violence is on a long-term decline. And even war is on a long-term decline. Nobody believes this. Surveys all show that people think the world is becoming more and more violent. But when you actually compile the empirical data, it's becoming less and less violent. Less and less violent. And war can't really solve the problems it was intended to solve. We dropped almost $100 million worth of Tomahawk missiles on Syria. They were on bombing runs the next day. It doesn't solve the, the problem, and yet it costs huge chunks of money that could go to health care. <laughs> so you've got this budget-killing uh, uh, te technology that really can't do the job. From a strictly, from a very cynical cost-benefit perspective, the bomb we dropped down in Afghanistan costs, what, $13 million? It kills somewhere between 35 and 100 people? If I look at that from a, as a pure, pure, good old capitalist, I go, that's not a really good return on my money, right? So we've got escalating cost of war that can't solve the problems. Capitalism has been creeping across the globe, and it creeps across the, across the globe looking for cheap labor. And any capitalist knows this. You, you want to cut, you want to make a profit, which is what capitalism thrives on. You need cheap labor. That's your biggest cost. So you look for the place where you're going to have cheap labor. After World War II, we sent our labor to Japan. It was cheap labor there. Capitalism has a wonderful property in that it tends to bring sort of living standards up, which raises wages. So we move to South Korea. Now we move to India and to China. China has seen the writing on the wall, so they're already in Africa building the infrastructure because they know they're going to shift their labor market there at some point in the future. Once their living standards come up, which they indeed are. Africa is the last major landmass to be uh, penetrated by, fully penetrated by, cap, by a capitalist economy. Once that's done, there'll be no cheap labor left on the planet. The earth is finite. So there's this sort of logical endpoint, just like with nuclear weapons, there's a logical endpoint that you can't sort of go beyond. There's a logical endpoint to capitalism as it currently operates. And that's going to happen really by the end of the century at the rate it's, it's, it's moving today. What can you do? Well, we already see what's happening in the U.S. It's automation and artificial intelligence that's replacing workers as a way to maximize profit. So you end up with this conundrum. <laughs> you don't have to hire any workers, which means they don't get paid, which means they don't have any money to buy the stuff you're producing. Capitalism is almost designed to, to reach this end point where it's got a conundrum that it has to solve. Globalization, that's a term you've all heard. It's all been a function of partly of, of capitalism, of things like empires, of slavery, all designed to move people around the world, move people of different cultural backgrounds around the world. War has driven people out of, of countries. Most recently, all the Syrians moving into 
uh, Europe, but also Libyans moving into, into Europe, Romanians and Poles moving to England. Uh, it's moved people of different cultural backgrounds all around. Many people are uncomfortable with this. They don't like it. And politicians know this, and they use this fact uh, to get themselves elected. Right now, the election in France, Marine Le Pen has a very good chance, and she is standing on the ground of, if I am elected, I will throw all the Arabs out of the country. That's her basic pla platform. It's been the platform of other politicians as, as well. And this process is happening all over the world. The people want to break away, form their own little entity, and keep different people out. So Britain breaks away from the EU. It has, really has nothing to do with economic stuff. The people who voted for it, which was mostly old people, they want to get the Romanians and the Hungarians and the Poles out of England, period. That's the reason they voted for it. That's not going to happen, but that's the reason they voted for it. They're not the only ones who brought, want to break away. Scotland could very well break away from the UK. The Tyrolians in Italy want to break away from Italy. The Catalonians in Spain want to break away from Spain. China's Uyghurs in the northwest part of China want their own autonomous region. Texas and other states have hmm, murmured about seceding from the United States. For some, this is, this is not funny. It's a serious discussion. They're sick of it. Give us our own state. We'll put up our walls, and we'll keep just the people we want inside here. This is the, the destructive part of globalization, and we should do everything possible to work against this ten tendency. The good news is there's the complete opposite tendency as, as well. We've seen things in the, in the 20th century, the creation of the United Nations. Its intention is to create global cooperation, create prosperity for the entire world. That's, that's, that was its original purpose. It's been stymied in that for various reasons, but that was its purpose. And that's a new thing. That's never existed before in the world when you, said, when you say, let's unify the globe. We see things like Doctors Without Borders. As an anthropologist, I find these all interesting because they signal sort of cultural shifts. Doctors Without Borders comes along in 1971. It's followed by groups like Engineers Without Borders and many others. These are made up of groups of people who may be very proud citizens of their country, but who also see everyone else in the world, especially everyone else in the world who's in pain, as their neighbors, as people they have to go help. These are, th these are global citizens. The people in Sudan are hurting. We've got to go there and help them. You can't just go, ah, screw it. You know, sucks to be them. Uh, they're, they're on their own. No, they don't, they don't believe that. And that's a growing trend in the world. This is the tsunami in um, the Indian Ocean of some year, years ago. The world responded to it. It's like, oh my God. Uh, those people are our neighbors. <laughs> we have to go help them. You would help your neighbor across the street if, if, if their house bur burned down. You would help them. These are people who have just taken that attitude and shifted it to the globe. They've become global cit citizens. This is constructed in part by social media that can transmit information everywhere in the world instantly, right? I could pick this up right now and call my friends in Finland, in Egypt, in China, doesn't matter. I might wake them up in the middle of the night, but I could do it right here, right now. Uh, we see it through things like the World Cup. We like to think that American football is like, you know, the world champions. No, <laughs> for, yeah, nobody else plays American football, right? It's soccer, that's the world game. Is there anyone in the world who doesn't know who Beyonce is? <laughs> Honestly, we've never, we've never been able, she's a magnificent singer, <laughs> that's what she is. We've, we've never been able to do this before, where entertainers and, and sports figures can literally have a global stage. This is also important. This is a bombed Syrian relief convoy of a couple years ago. People were upset about it. Now, any, anyone in the military will tell you, you know, war is messy and bad stuff happens by accident. 
sorry, but when you start playing around with bombs and stuff, sometimes hospitals get hit, relief convoys get hit, but people don't accept it. They say no. President Trump, became, when after, soon after he became president, ordered a, an operation in Yemen. We lost one American uh, soldier. One. John McCain said, if you lose one soldier, it's a failure. The operation is a failure. What was the casualty rate in the first 24 hours of the D-Day landing? Mm -mm. They don't actually know the specific number, but it, it's around 10,000, half of those deaths. That's just the first 24 hours. It was an awful battle. Uh, Omaha was t terrible, awful battle. But that's about the figure that Eisenhower and Churchill figured out. That's about what they expected to happen. And they had to calculate the casualty rate in order to know how many hospital ships, how many doctors, how many pints of blood do we have to have waiting, waiting there. They had to calculate that. They, they come down to 10,000. Okay, we can live with that. Now, can you imagine the President of the United States saying, we're going to send an operation into wherever, Libya, Syria, Yemen, wherever, and we expect 10,000 American casualties in the first 24 hours. Would the president be able to sell that to the country? The president wouldn't be able to sell it to the, to the country. We're not, we can't tolerate one death. What about 10,000? Our, 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 our attitude towards that level of violence has changed. It's shifted. So, the effect of those three processes. One, in the fifth beginning, we're at the beginning of the end of war. War no longer works, except to suck up huge amounts of, of cash. We have to find another solution. Partly because there's still problems that have to be solved. It's, it's not a perfectly lovely, peaceful world that we live in. Still got problems to solve. And we're taking money away from things where we desperately need it. It's the beginning of a post-capitalist economy. I don't mean socialism. I don't mean communism. I mean something completely different that's never existed before in the world. What it'll be, I don't know. I'm an archaeologist. I can't think about these, these things. But I can tell you as an archaeologist, it's, it's going to change. It has to change. And it's the beginning of what I like to call global self-governance, a unification of the globe. We are unified economically. You tug one little economic string someplace in the world, it plays out all across the rest of the world. We're already unified eco economically, or at least linked eco economically. We're going to see a different way in which people are going to relate to, e to, e to each other. What will that be? You know, the really good news about the fifth beginning is that we know the past. We've seen what the, the world has been through pre previously. We know a lot about how human societies operate, how economies operate, how people will make decisions about health care. We can, we can predict that. So here's the good news about the fifth beginning. And it's something that was not true of any of the, the previous four. We get to decide. We get to construct it. It's up to us. If it's an abject failure, it's on us. If it's a success, it's on us too. Thanks. We have time for any questions for talk? Yes, you didn't fit the uh, industrial age in there anyway. That would be in the fourth. The, the, the industrial age is, is part of that, that fourth beginning. I, I really see the industrial age as, as simply the, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the outgrowth of things that were already going, going on. People were continually trying to find ways to increase the amount of, of energy to bring into production. And for many, many years, that was just, that was people. Bring more and more people in. That's why you get slavery. That's why you get empires. To that, that, that was, the people were the coal of the day. 
And the more people you have, the more energy you have to, to produce things. It takes a lot of people to build a pyramid and a lot of, a lot of years. And that people are constantly looking for new sources of energy. And eventually, through you know, experimentation and so on, they figure out coal, steam engines. And suddenly you don't need people. And that's when capitalism kicks, kicks in. You can get rid of, of, of labor. Uh, we, we can, and it, it really has a lot to do with population density, has a lot to do with the, what the local environment has to offer to people. So you don't get agriculture in places like, like the Arctic because you can't, you know, or Laramie because <laughs> you, can't, you can't grow a damn thing there, right? Uh, especially corn, which needs a 90-day growing season, mi minimally 90-day gro growing season. So that's, 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 that's part of the answer to the, to the, to the, to the question. Um, some students at this point say, well, you know, in the Western US, people were still hunter-gatherers at the time that Europeans arrived. So they never went through that stage of agriculture in the state. And my answer is, actually, they did. Because agriculture and the state were sort of creeping across the globe, and it didn't get to the Western US until, you know, into the 19th century. But it eventually got there. So yeah, we can, I think we can explain it. So in the second beginning, you talked about um, rituals mm -hmm. and um, religion. Mm -hmm. um, what do you define as religion? For, for me, re religion is a belief in an afterlife and a world after, <coughs> after death. Um, a belief that there are forces at work that are not you and me, that are, that are, not, that are not human. Those forces, well, the, 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 there's lots of variation in religion, as you well know. Uh, so there are different kinds of forces for some people that are just, they are just sort of animating spirits that exist throughout the, the inanimate world. Um, for some, it's a pantheon of gods. For some, it's a single, a single god. So. Would that be spirituality belief? Yes. Um, so further on, um, isn't religion in a way the organization of these spiritual beliefs and the way it's displayed to groups that be considered religion? It's, it's, every group has its own set of ideas about what what exists in the world, not only what exists in the material world, but what exists in the non-material world, what happens to you after you die. You know, for some it's reincarnation, for some it's heaven or hell, and, and for, for others it's still different, different things. So what, um, I was, well, my question was, I was just wanting to get a little background in religion. My question was, so during the second uh, beginning, they like gathered together and like have these master ceremonies and stuff like that? They would probably have had some kind of ceremonies, some kinds of rituals that would, things that they thought they would have to do in order to, in order to really be proper humans. Um, I don't want to say appease the spirits, but do the appropriate things so that um, uh, so that their life in the next world go, moves in the direction they want it to move in. So, uh, on the slide where you were saying that we'll probably see the world reach about 10 billion people, uh, do you believe it'll cap at that point for the, uh, the fifth stage? Or do you think, uh, and if it does cap at any point, do you think it'll uh, kind of make it like stagnant? Or do you think it'll kind of um, heighten some of the effects. It'll speed up some of the effects because you've got more people, you've got more people who you need to feed and um, uh, more people that have to be organized. Uh, the pre pre predicting the future is <laughs> a dangerous business. Uh, in fact, most predictions about the future, about the 95% of predictions about the future don't 
don't, don't come true. Uh, which is why I don't actually predict the future. I'm actually making my recommendations for the, for the future. <laughs> Cheer. Cheer. <laughs> um, uh, uh, po po population growth, <coughs> so it's, what, what you're seeing in here is sort of a projection of population growth, but this is some of the, the variation that we might expect given different scenarios about how things could, 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 could go. So one prediction has got the human population reaching about 11 billion by the end of this cent century. It's, uh, the, the question people usually ask me is, are we going to reach a point of a massive famine? I mean, we'll have too many people to, f to feed. Demographers have tried to calculate the carrying capacity of the Earth for humans. And the number is somewhere between 12 and 15 billion. That doesn't mean that people will live extremely well. Uh, I mean, evolution doesn't care if you live well. <laughs> it only cares if you live to uh, rep reproduce. Um, this, the Earth could actually do this. I mean, we throw away about 25% of the food produced in the world is thrown away. A, a huge amount of effort is put into producing junk food. We grow lots of potatoes to make potato chips. You know, it's, it's a grow, grow lots of corn to make popcorn. If you devote, to, you know, we grow corn in order to make corn syrup to make soda which probably should be banned. Uh, uh, so so the, you would have to do all of those things in order to support a, a considerably larger pop population in the, in, the, in the world. But it's not, it's not impossible. I mean, a world of 10 billion, which you will see almost certainly, um, is not impossible. It's then, it, it will then actually decline if you can go out past 2100 they expect the world population to actually then decline. And the reason they're, they're predicting it will decline is that rates of the, the, the growth rate of the world today, I think is around 1.4%. Most of that growth is occurring in uh, developing nations. Developed nations like the United States, Britain, France, Japan, th th France is actually paying people to have kids. They're deathly afraid that the French will disappear. Because in developed nations, family size goes down. Completed fertility goes, goes down. Women don't have as many children. I came from, my mother gave birth to seven children and then adopted two. I have two sons. <laughs> you know, my sister has two sons. Uh, Two other sisters have no kids. They said, nah, the hell with that. And, you know, I have two brothers with no kids, right? Th this is what happens as de nations develop is people have fewer, fewer children. Japan is worried. It's worried that it's not going to have enough people to take care, not, not going to have enough young people to take care of its old people. I know, I know this, the way to solve that problem is to import all the people from the islands that are going to, disappear because of global rise, send them to Japan, right? Uh, so that, that's, that's why we expect it to actually go down. Probably before it hits 12 to 15 billion, it will go down. If the if living standards go up, family size will go down if, if the past can be used to predict the future. See, I was just wondering if like, famine could uh, just cause like, the human population to drop by like, half or whatever. It could be famine or it could be um, uh, 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 illness. For it to be disease, it'd have to be one heck of a killer that moves very fast and kills very quickly. You know, um, Ebola could have been a, a candidate, but you know, we're really bright. And, and we can go in and stop these things before they, they, they spread rad radically. So I, I don't see disease doing it. It would have to be something really un unknown. <laughs>